Hello. Oh, wonderful to see all of you back again for another classics. Here we are. Yeah, we're not, not only back for another concert, we're back for another season. So thank you for being here. Many of you probably already know at least a couple of us, but uh, this is, of course, Laura Jackson, music director and conductor of the Reno Phil. Head flailer. And I'm Chris Morrison, writing the program notes, and you hear me yap yapping away on KNCJ occasionally. And with us also is our piano soloist for tonight, Daniela Liebman. <laughs> Daniela, welcome to Reno. Thank you, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's such a beautiful city. I had a time to walk around earlier today and I'm a little in love. <laughs> so, so did you find the river? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I did, I found it. <laughs> She's staying at the Renaissance and w for our first rehearsal, she had not yet found the river. So we had to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, the Reno Phil was nice enough to arrange fairly decent weather for you. That's so true. thank you for that. I'm very yes. Grateful. Oh yes, that was all me. <laughs> So I'm going to start tonight by embarrassing you by asking Laura about how you two <laughs> met and why yeah. Daniela was your choice for the first concert of the new season. Yes. I met Daniela. I should have thought about what year it was. Do you remember what year it was? I don't. Okay. It was about five years ago, five or six oh, years oh, ago. Right. I was asked to guest conduct the Hartford Symphony, and they let me know that we had this fabulous soloist, Daniela Liebman, coming, who I had not yet heard of. And um, then I heard she was all of like 15 or 16 years old, and that she was playing Chopin number two. And then I got just slightly concerned, <laughs> only because that piece requires a lot of artistic uh, finesse and maturity and I was thinking, oh, well, this might be interesting, but anyway, oh, great. And uh, I was completely blown away. I was blown away by Daniela's beautiful musical spirit, her freedom, her spontaneity as a chamber musician on stage. Um, she is pure joy as, uh, as a player. And then, uh, and at the time, she had recently moved from Mexico to Dallas, and she was studying with a teacher in Dallas. Tell us about Thomas that. Thomas Ungar. Yeah. yeah, I spent seven years there with him. Yes. And so she was really at the early stages of her career, and uh, you had performed in many, you know, with various orchestras in Mexico, but you were basically fairly new to the, to the U.S. So uh, I then brought her to Heart, uh, uh, Wichita Symphony, I was asked to guest conduct there and had the lovely occasion that they asked me for recommendations for a soloist. So Daniela was at the top of the list and we did a lovely Mozart there. We had a great time. And so it is with great pleasure and pride that I bring her now to Reno. And I, um, I hope you love hearing her as much as I love making music with her. That's great. <laughs> We don't always start by embarrassing our guest <laughs> artist at the beginning of the pre-concert talk, but you had very nice things to say about your experiences with Laura, too, when we spoke for the yeah. Reno Phil podcast. Oh my gosh, it's, I think, really rare, especially with playing something like Chopin too, which is such, I mean, it's a piece that's so piano, orchestra, piano, orchestra, piano with orchestral accompaniment. It's very sort of not chamber music at all, and I think, um, it's just one of the few times on stage that I played with you that I didn't even think about that once. And there was just such um, this spirit of constant organic music making and, and spontaneity and originality and you just, you, you lived it. You didn't really play it, you just lived it and I took I just followed her. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, was, it was such an amazing it was experience. I'm so, it was so happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to see you again. Did you take to the piano from a very young age, and was it your choice, and was it a happy choice? Um, I, I think I, I took to the piano from a young age. It was not my choice, but it was a happy choice. Okay, good. <laughs> um, my dad's a violinist, so I come from a musical family, 
And so I think my first instrument was the violin, but I was two years old and they rented something this big and I had no idea what to do with it. And so that was a bad idea. <laughs> and um, then I started when I was five and I've just grown to love it very, very deeply since it's the thing that keeps me sort of um, centered and uh, genuinely you know, fulfilled, I guess. <laughs> Was there a particular moment when you realized that this might be how you wanted to make your living, or was it sort of a gradual process that you realized, okay, this might be something I can pursue for years and decades to come? Oh, man. That's a hard question. Because mm. <laughs> I think it, it, it had always been a dream of mine to, to live from it. Just I think just to live from anything that you love doing is a blessing. And um, But I remember being three and just assuming that you know, being a contra pianist, like the easiest thing in the world. All you had to do was just play what you wanted to. And, and then, wear pretty dresses, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. And it was, just, it was just, like, why was everyone saying it wasn't hard, you know? Like, but I think probably when I was around 12 or 13, I started to grasp, grasp the more intellectual aspect of it. And I feel like that's when I really started, you know, viewing concerts as more than just me in a practice room, except I'm not in a practice room anymore. Right. <laughs> um, so I think probably since around that age when I realized just the potential that music has to not only give you so much joy, but also create this whole world born from your mind mm. that you get to share with people. And that's just such a unique experience and I'm, I'm lucky to get the right bird lucky. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That <laughs> Sorry, that was me. That you say. <laughs> Um, you know, that it, when you were really, really young, that it was like I was either in my practice room doing this or out on stage doing this, but, you know, it was sort of all the same. And then you grasp the meaning and power of the audience and what they bring to the occasion, what your attention brings to our ability to perform, because we love what we love and we really, really love to share what we love. Hmm. Yeah, it changes it completely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you a question kind of like this in the podcast. I asked you about immediate future plans, if you were the sort of person that planned things out, you know, a specific three or five year plan. I don't want to ask that exact question, but something related. Do you have at this point a sort of big vision for yourself of where you would like to see yourself in your career, maybe in 10 or 20 years? No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually heartened to hear you say that because yeah. I'm, I'm still, I'm about three times as old as you are and I'm still waiting to figure out yeah. how, when that's, and what it's going to be. I mean, I think I have a very clear idea of what direction I want to go in musically. Hmm. And I, as far as I feel like career is concerned, it's really just, I'm just grateful. I'm just it sort of ends there. <laughs> it kind of doesn't. Sometimes it really doesn't matter where it is or, or who I'm playing for. It's just sort of this, um, I don't know, um, a career, just an opportunity to share and live from it. But I, I, there's not much of a plan in there for me except just happy to do it. <laughs> but it doesn't seem that you're lacking for opportunities to be able to do that. I, I, I feel so so very, very lucky to, to be able to just even be here and... I met you in the first place and played with you, and and, um, and for now, I'll be able to, yeah. <laughs> we haven't talked yet about what you're playing tonight, which is the piano concerto by Clara Schumann, a piece that doesn't get heard very much, unfortunately, but a piece that she was unusually young when she wrote. She was, uh, what, started it at age 14? She, I believe she was 13 when she 13. started, 13. Reading she started it, it. writing it, yep and finished it when she was 15, I think. Yeah. Um, what is this piece like for you as a piano soloist? Because Clara Schumann went on to have this amazing reputation as a pianist throughout the 19th century. Uh, but this is her sort of right at the beginning and taking on a big ambitious piece for a, one of the first times ever. But she obviously has the piano skills, which she reflects in how she writes for the piano in this piece. <laughs> it's ridiculously difficult. <laughs> yeah, you know, if, if you don't mind, we were talking about this last night, that, um, you know, one of the, some of the most difficult 
repertoire for pianist is written by Franz Liszt. And, and Daniela was saying, you wouldn't believe this, but Clara Schumann is actually like more difficult than Franz Liszt. And it's so interesting because you don't completely hear that. But what is so extraordinary to me about the fact that it is so difficult and virtuosic is that this was a 13 year old who was writing for herself because she was already a, a, an international phenom as a performer as of age 11. So she was truly an extraordinary pianist. And the other thing that strikes me about this piece is that there's a uniqueness to the compositional voice. I can't quite put my hand on it, and maybe, maybe you can, but the, I, I just really feel like it is uh, uh, the voice of an individual. This is, it's not an imitation of anybody else. And, and that's there's, really there's amazing. There's slight reminiscences of other composers, but For sure. they, they don't last very long. Yeah. It, it is really her, it seems. I think, I especially love this piece as well, not only because it's so, her voice is, is so obvious, but also because I really feel like it reflects her as a person at that moment in time. Because I mean, it's such, it's such a, like on one hand, I can't believe it's written <laughs> by a 13, 14, 15 year old. But on the other hand, it has this kind of sincerity yeah. that I think can sometimes only be achieved at that age. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's this sort of um, just wanting to discover and show and this passion to just sort of this curiosity, this unbelievable curiosity. Um, and I think that's sort of what makes me feel like it's different to the Moscheles and the Kalkbrenner, like the pianists that you never hear play today, mm. <laughs> except for maybe some obscure festival. But um, I think she's so special in the sense that she already had a personality that was completely formed at, at, at that age. And um, I think, uh, if anything, sort of the reflections that you can hear of other composers in that time almost just, it makes me, it's endearing. It's, mm. it's not repetitive and it's not unoriginal, it's just endearing <laughs> to yeah. sort of hear her yeah. be inspired and then hear her own take on it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to dwell on the tragic fact that this is the only piano concerto she wrote. She wrote, I guess, an additional movement. She started one like a dozen sketches. years later or something like that. Yeah. And there are two other orchestral pieces, I think, which actually predate the piano concerto. Yeah. Uh, but there's so little music that she produced and one can't help but wonder, I mean, it's not like she didn't have a musically fulfilled life. She was world famous and played 1300 concerts over her career and uh, also raised eight children and was the trusted confidant of yes. her husband, Robert and Johannes Brahms. Eight children. <laughs> Eight children. It's, in fact, amazing as a program note writer, whenever I write about either Robert Schumann or Johannes Brahms, inevitably I'll find a really good quote from Clara Schumann talking about the piece of music because she was the one person that both of them sought out for her opinion. They valued her musicality and her, personally, so very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it's uh, truly extraordinary. You know, I, I think it might be worth mentioning one really unusual feature of this concerto, and that is the second movement. Because the orchestra doesn't do anything at all. Um, like, literally. We sit there, and Daniela starts, and she's playing this absolutely gorgeous, slow movement, slow movement, slow movement. And then, if you have a ticket on this side of the hall, you'll be glad in that moment because suddenly it becomes a duet between the principal cellist and Daniela. And so Peter Lenz is, is playing with Daniela and um, it's, it's just breathtaking. It's amazingly beautiful and unique. And then at the very, very end, in the last few bars, the timpani comes in and then that leads us, it sort of heralds us into the third movement, but it is just a very unusual uh, feature. Yeah, for somebody who's writing this at 14 or whatever, to have that unusual an idea that, as 
I think I've mentioned to both of you, I've tried to find other examples of that where in the middle of a concerto, the orchestra just stops playing for an entire movement. You don't find things like that. I think it's so, I think it also sort of opens up this vulnerability in the mm. piece that comes from the piece because it's just such a fearless thing to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, just to be that simple. Yeah, mm. exactly. I mean, especially when, I mean, you're thir 13, 15, you're probably going around trying to prove yourself um, to get a career started mm. like she very much did and to just not care. And like you said, write it for herself and probably um, the musicians who she knew and just wanted to play with. Um, I actually think Mendelssohn conducted the debut, <laughs> which mm. really found kind of funny. Yeah. But yeah, it is, it's, so, it's so fearless. I, I admire that so much. Yeah. I know you want to get backstage and get prepared for the performance, but I will ask one more question, which, or maybe make an observation, that you're still carrying on your education as you are carrying on your concert careers at the same time, right? Yeah, 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 I'm in my third year at Juilliard. What? I mean, for somebody with an established career that you already have, what are you studying? <laughs> Piano <laughs> performance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so th there are still things that you want to learn in a, in a formal sort of academic setting. It's, it's never ending. It's really never ending. I think, I mean, more than anything else, um, I think going to a conservatory and taking all these classes that um, sometimes seem unrelated or unrelated enough that you would ask why they directly impact what you do. I think one of the most important things, if not the most important thing I found just living alongside the piano is it's much more important to be a musician than it is to be a pianist. Mm -hmm. And I think just, just the simple fact of being in a group of people where, I mean, oh my God, I've learned as much or more from my peers than I have from my teachers. Mm -hmm from my liberal arts teachers as from my piano teachers. Um, and just, you know, learning how um, a person's identity can shape something like a musical texture or um, the spirit of a piece and, you know, how using uh, theory or improvisation to understand the language of what you're saying, not only to memorize it and to convey it, but to actually be able to almost internalize it and then make it your own in a way. I think all of those things are skills that make you um, more complete, a more complete musician, more complete. Human. Yeah, yeah human. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're hesitating to say that, but it's true. <laughs> human. I have like a dozen follow-up questions, but I'm gonna resist the temptation. Um, maybe I'll save them for tomorrow's pre-concert talk. Here we go. Anyway. We'll let you go right now. Daniela, thank you so much for thank speaking so with much. us and thank look forward so to the for performance coming. tonight. <laughs> thank you. So Laura, we have two other pieces on the program tonight. Pieces that will be a little more familiar, I think, to many uh, than the Clara Schumann Piano Concerto. Yeah. Uh, one of which starts the season and it's a legendarily difficult one for the orchestra, <laughs> uh, which is Don Juan by Richard Strauss. Interestingly enough, another relatively young composer, not quite as young as Clara Schumann, but Strauss is only 24 when he's writing this. I know. And I think many, many people who have written about this would agree that he'd written a ton of music. He was a bit of a prodigy. Mm -hmm. He'd already written a couple of symphonies, a couple of concertos. But he hadn't really found that very special individual Straussian voice. And a lot of people agree that Don Juan is the place where he found it. Yeah, you know, uh, to the first thing that you said about this being just an insanely difficult piece to play, it is absolutely true. And that is for every single musician on stage. You know what's interesting about this? The first page of Don Juan is on every single audition that you hear for every instrument. It is just unbelievable because from the first downbeat I give, it's as though the entire orchestra is doing a series of triple backflips, I don't know what, you know? And it's incredibly doing it all colorful in, from the listener's perspective. Yeah, they're, and they're all like in unison together and it's just, there's no warming up into this. So it's actually slightly cruel that I put this on the first concert. It's like everybody's coming back after the summer and wah, you know. 
But uh, I've been really, really pleased uh, that the orchestra is sounding terrific on it. And I think, you know, the, the Straussian kind of writing, Strauss had an unbelievable facility with orchestration and with just um, creating gesture out of the orchestral textures. He, his knowledge of what instruments could do is just really mind boggling. And what we hear in this piece is the juxtaposition of Don Juan's uh, bravura and arrogance, and he's the, the um, you know, he's, 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 he's Don Juan. He's loving and leaving everybody in his path, you know? Um, and you, there are these absolutely gorgeous melodies that come out of near silence, and they're so alluring and sensual and just beautiful in every way. And I think it's the juxtaposition of power with um, that kind of vulnerability that is incredible. We get the sound of the full orchestra and we get wonderful solos, a, a bunch of them, the oboe and violin in particular, but there are lots of others as well. And because Strauss is it's not storytelling in the sense that, you know, this happens at this particular point in the music and this happens at this particular point. In general, we get the sense of Don Juan's character. We have love scenes in the piece. But because Strauss is telling the story of Don Juan, Don Juan loses his life in a duel at the end. So after all of this activity, the ending of the piece is sort of surprising in its sort of kind of almost eeriness. Yes, and it's there, you know, he is... There, the doom is projected, um, forecast in the middle of the piece. We're sort of barreling along with all this um, uh, very effervescent, lively music, and then suddenly it stops. And you have this, this sort of falling gesture, and that foreshadows the end, the coda, which um, is another, everything literally stops, and everybody will know that you're the smart people that came to the pre-concert lecture because you won't clap at that moment. Right. Yeah, there is actually a second or two or three of silence. It's like it dead seems... silence. And I will try to make it really clear, like, you know, stop <laughs> in some unusual position so you can tell everybody who's about to to just, like, wait. And then um, it's, it's super quiet, and there's this, like, jab that comes out of the the trumpets, uh, and whether that's the sword duel, you know, the final blow, um, you know, as the Nicholas Linau, the Nicholas poet. Linau's um, play that this is modeled after and 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 uh, uh, taken from, basically Don Juan in the end is uh, feeling empty. He's feeling that his life is without meaning, and. Um, he, you know, in some versions, you know, Don Juan is looking for the ideal woman, some sort of ideal connection and can never find it. And, and um, so then it's, it's sort of his surrender at the end yeah. that, that ends his life. And, and uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's just an amazing performance journey. It's an amazing musical um, journey and just uh, an incredible composition. Yeah, all of that packed into what, 18 minutes or something? Yeah, 19 minutes. Mm -hmm. Believe me, everybody will be sweating at the end. <laughs> <laughs> then in the second half of the program, it's almost as though we don't need to talk about it because many of us have heard the thing so many times before, but it never fails to move and delight and surprise and send one out of the concert hall exhilarated, which is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Can I just tell you what a kick it is to do this piece? It is, um, it's also really daunting. And sometimes, I've done it many times with many different orchestras. And at times in my career, oh, I'm getting all like personal. <laughs> oh, I have decided I'm never doing this piece again. I'm just never yeah. doing it. I have literally said that. And I actually turned down a concert where I was uh, a guest conducting concert where I was, because it's frightening. This piece is frightening. It's, there are so many possibilities for train wrecks, you know? 
It's very, um, there, it's, it's literally living on the edge. It is fate, it is in your face. It is a roller coaster ride. And it's not just the first movement. <laughs> you probably know that um, Beethoven five, like isn't just the first five minutes of ba 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 bomb, ba 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 bomb. That movement ends and then there are another three movements, right? You know? Um, and they all come from that same four note gesture. All of the movements emanate from that. So it's a work of utter genius, of, of um, brilliantly context, uh, contrasting textures. It's, it's incredible. And it's, it's wickedly um, challenging, uh, both in terms of concentration for every single person on stage. I think that's the number one thing about the piece. And even though everybody on the stage has performed this piece many times, we have rehearsed the begonias out of it. And I played it all the way through, except we didn't, we didn't have time for every single note last night, but I played it all the way through just about last night and then all the way through again today because you have to rehearse the concentration so that you carry the drama and the electricity in every single articulation. And the articulation is how the bow hits the string. It's how the air meets the, the reed on the instrument. And that's where the drama is. That's where it's in those details. It's not just in playing the notes. It's in how you start, how you prep it, how you breathe. Oh, I'm tired already. And all of those pieces fitting together so well, you have remarked before about how exposed the music is. So very much like Mozart is, where you hear everything and everything needs to fit together. So even, as you say, we're so familiar with it, the musicians are so familiar with it, you are, but you never get a chance to rest on your laurels. You have to ha maintain that concentration and clarity from the orchestra for 30 to 35 minutes. Yeah, and I also, what's interesting too, is that I, I go back and study it every time. I go back and um, I've decided that the next time I do it, I'm gonna start a brand new score and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, remark the whole thing. Because, you know, as you live with a piece and do it multiple times, you hear something different every time you do it. You, you experience something, you hear a little inner voice, you hear how, oh my gosh, the basses carry the theme underneath all of these you know, extended melodies, and so I really wanna bring that out. And the horns have this wonderful, you know, there's just little quarter notes that are, are sort of outlining a frame around a picture, but you notice little things, and, and so your relationship to the piece changes over time, um, and that's also what's wonderful. It never gets stale. And the roller coaster ride takes you through a remarkable range of emotions over that half hour. We start, the phrase in medias res always occurs to me when we start Beethoven's Fifth. It's like we've, we're launched right into the middle of high drama. We don't even know what it's about yet, but suddenly we are right there in the middle of it. And it goes from there, there are some peace in the second movement, a little hint of what is to come in the fourth. The third movement, which just 10 or 20 years before Beethoven would have been a nice, polite minuet. It isn't a minuet in Beethoven. It's not, not something all. you would be dancing to. Yeah. But then the fourth movement, which is just overpowering triumph. Yeah. It's the, amazing. The, this piece, this symphony, really defined the iconic, symphonic journey of turmoil and struggle to transformation at the end, sort of liberation at the end. And that is definitely the journey of this piece. You start with all the drama, ba 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 ba, the fate knocking at your door. And then by the last movement, it's just, I mean, the whole thing just lifts off. It has so much joy and energy. Um, it's, you just feel like you're racing to the end in a jubilant kind of wonderful way. We've come to the end of our time, I'm afraid. No. <laughs> There we is so have. much more to say. You're going to have to come back tomorrow for the second pre-concert talk so we can <laughs> deal with all of the other stuff that I wanted to ask about. But this was a very good introduction to tonight, which is going to be pretty spectacular, I think. I'm so thrilled you're here. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thank you very coming. much for being here. Enjoy. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.